students around the world are finishing their qualifications so they can get ahead in life and make their contribution. If you are studying, researching or thinking about it, you will need practical tips, techniques, coaching and support to help you get finished and be successful. I'm Peter Alkema, the Student Success Coach and welcome to the podcast. Each episode I interview successful students and leaders in education so that you will learn everything you need right here. You will learn about writing, completing your thesis and other projects, planning, discipline, how to get more done, supervisors, getting published, getting finished, how to have the right discipline and many other aspects of student life. Whether you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, Google or any other podcast platform, please leave a rating and a review or if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe and leave a comment. Either way, please get in touch and let us know what you think of the show and what you want to hear more of. Please always check the show notes for links to courses, material and plenty more so that you can use what you've learned in each episode, take action and achieve your student success. Please also join the Student Success Coach community in our exclusive members-only Facebook group where I post regularly and you can interact with fellow students just like yourself. Remember, you can't do this alone, so reach out, get involved and take advantage. It's my commitment to your success. Now for this week's episode. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Tessa, thank you so much for joining uh, the Student Success Coach podcast today. Um, I am so thrilled to be back in touch with you again. We chatted, I think, a couple of years ago. And um, I guess, you know, we've all had a tough time um, in uh, the last n- number of months. And uh, I guess, you know, like me, uh, you've added studies to your life as well. And like me, you're also busy. And like many of our listeners today, they're also busy and frazzled and struggling to make ends meet and get through everything. And then, of course, we had all the challenges of, of 2020 and those seem to be uh, continuing. So, Tessa, I'm keen to talk through all of that, you know, in our in our chat this morning and get into some of your practices and tips and techniques because as I always say to people no matter what tough times you're going through you've got something to contribute you've got something that can help somebody else some piece of wisdom or inspiration that you can pass on and that's really what our listeners are looking for today in the session so we'll get into that in a minute but before we do that maybe you could just give us a bit of introduction give us some insight into who you are and maybe specifically what your academic journey as a student has been so far. Sure, Peter, thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, Yeah, so uh, I finished my undergrad degree. I did uh, just a three year BSc computer science and mathematics at University of Pretoria a long time ago. So 1982 to 84. Um, And huge demand at that point in time in IT for for IT skills. So at that point, I didn't uh, even bothered to do my honours, I just went straight into good career opportunities, uh, which included uh, working for a for a German uh, software company. Uh, and I also worked in Germany for a bit. And anyway, long story short, I, I was a basically a very technical uh, software developer, coder, tech team leader, um, so on for about 32, 33 years. And in 2016, 2015, 2016, I suddenly got the feeling that I was, in terms of my career, going down a passage that to me was still well lit, lots of new interesting things happening all the time, but it was like it was getting narrow and narrow and narrow. And I guess in one word, I was getting a bit uh, bored with what I was doing, Um, coding, coding, the same kind of patterns, new technologies all the time, but yet quite, uh, I was getting, but it was time for for something new. Um, And I was invited by one of my colleagues at West Bank to participate in his survey for his Masters of Information Technology at uh, Pretoria University. And I was like, 
Okay, so I did this survey and then I invited him for a coffee and I said, what is this degree you're doing? It sounds interesting. And he told me about it and I realised uh, when I looked uh, on, on Taki's website, on the university's website, you don't have to have honours to do that Master of Information Technology. The university recognises career experience as well as an alternative to having done honours. And I thought, yeah, I guess 33 years in, you know, hardcore work uh, is probably... That's plenty experience. Yes. So, um, well, yeah, I, I applied. I went through the process applying and I thought, well, how I was I was already, how old was I then? I think I was 52 and I thought, I don't know if they're going to want an old lady like me doing my master's. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, I was very blessed, surprised and blessed when I when I got accepted into the course. And then I was like a Jack Russell who'd caught the bus. I was like, oh, you know, chased and caught the bus. I was like, yay, oh no, now I have to do this. So anyway, I dived in first day in the course. I uh, went and sat in the front of the class because, um, you know, I had, had to see well and hear well and all that. Not, not that I have hearing or eye problems really, but I just let me sit in the front. And when I looked around, I realized I was the oldest student in the class. So that was a bit intimidating, but I mean, I enjoyed, I loved the, the whole situation, being on campus, being in lectures, meeting all our lecturers. So I was very like bright eyed and bushy tailed despite being the oldest student in the group. We were 40, 40 students. So it was it was a wonderful experience. Hard work for two years, 50% uh, coursework, 50% uh, mini dissertation. And I remember, Peter, that's where you presented uh, one guest lecture you did on uh, Agile, uh, which I really enjoyed. And that was quite relevant to me. I had at that point, I was already, I think we were busy writing our proposals for our mini dissertations. And that's where I started with my interest in um, agility and what it is and how it emerges. So for my masters, I chose this monstrous uh, topic of um, uh, agility in enterprise data management. Which, uh, yeah, I, I think when one is inexperienced uh, in terms of postgrad studies, like I was, didn't really know what this means to choose such a topic. But I, I went ahead and, and in the end uh, ended up with a, with a good mini dissertation. I did well in my master's degree, the, the tenacity, determination, and being so interested in learning all this new stuff that was very different to all the coding I'd done for so many years and everything I'd learned there. But doing, I, I really, um, I put a lot of effort in, but I enjoyed it. And, and that kind of positive uh, interest that I had and also enjoying my topic for my research, uh, I, I did quite well. However, I, I kind of felt I hadn't finished the work that I'd started. Um, and then as fate would have it, uh, in 2017, I was uh, retrenched actually from West Bank. Uh, that, that was a whole uh, interesting life experience, but um, I had time to really think about, well, what next? Um, and uh, I then, uh, my supervisor for my masters actually said, look, we want you to do your PhD, or maybe also because I had um, passed my uh, master's with distinction. Um, the university was very keen to have me continue with my PhD. And uh, so I thought, well, why not? While I'm sitting thinking what to do next with my career. And that's how what my journey was. Um, and I also decided to change my career. And, you know, I used that whole difficult situation. I, I always say to my, my two boys when they face tough things that a tough situation, any kind of stress is actually a form of energy. If you see it as a form of energy, then you can focus on channeling that into whatever you're trying to deal with. And that's what I really did. I ch channeled the stress of wanting to change my career and not knowing how to do it with 
the retrenchment with uh, the kind of excitement and anxiety about embarking on a PhD, I just decided to channel all of that and to start integrating what I was trying to do. And I'm a very visual person, so I have, that's why my office looks like this. I'm forever scribbling, drawing. It's wonderful. Um, it's a perfect student, perfect student uh, sort of um, hive of activity. I love it. Yes. And, so, and those of you listening, yeah. those of you listening on the podcast and um, hop over to the YouTube channel and you'll be able to see Tessa's uh, office artifacts up on the board uh, behind us. Definitely a sign of a of a very engaged, busy and successful student, Tessa. Well done. <laughs> it keeps my, and that is one of the, what has been one of my anchors. So I would say for me, what's really helped is to understand what is going on in your own head. Acknowledge what you're feeling as well as what you are trying to do, what's important to you, what you love, what excites you. And actually the rougher your experience is at any point in time, the better your opportunity is to actually sit back and, and consider that. And if you can't think straight, then start drawing. I, I have various, uh, I have a sort of a little personal diary that I write any sorts in that kind of pop up. I always have a pen next to my bed and a piece of paper. I even sometimes write in the dark if I don't want to switch the light on. And the next morning I'm trying to figure out what did I write? <laughs> But um, then I also have, I, I buy these um, like nice format um, books, just plain blank paper. Yep. And I draw and scribble all sorts of things, different color pens, whatever. And I have a couple of, filled a couple of those already over the years. And I don't bother to date or to organize and be terribly formal about it. I just write down and draw, but obviously trying to focus all the time. So what am yeah. I struggling with? What am I trying to do? So so that's kind of my approach. I'm a very visual mm. person in my job. I'm a data architect, so I enjoy the abstract thinking in yeah. pictures. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I think- And Tessa- yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah no, wonderful, thank you. I mean, and if I could just be so, Bold is to suggest that um, just uh, I can see behind you there next to your whiteboard. If I can recall the chat we had, you were busy developing that model for um, agility in uh, enterprise data. Yeah. And it does look quite familiar with that pyramid in the middle and then the the model with the left and the right. Just at the top there on the right hand side of your whiteboard, is that now a next level version of that visualization that we were discussing, I think, a couple of years ago? Yes, you know, in a way it is, the thing has kind of evolved and this is what's so wonderful about all the scribblings in my, uh, I guess you could call it a research journal, I don't know what the, what the official name is, but I can I can see there, it's kind of like a timeline, not a timeline because I don't, I always forget to put dates, but I can see how my thought processes have evolved. So that pyramid that you're referring to, that's kind of was my research strategy and actually that thing has hold pretty solid. I've, I've changed the wording in there. So I guess on that point, it was really important that I started with the strategy. I think, you know, in one's work, in one's life, as in one's PhD, master's degree, it's good to have a strategy. So, okay, what am I actually trying to do? Not just to dive into a whole sea of interesting stuff. What are you actually trying to do? Because it has to start narrowing down from quite early on Otherwise, one would get lost in a sea of, of knowledge and, and not being able to, to find your way out, never mind uh, document something interesting and useful. So that was my research strategy. But the, the stuff that I have uh, at the top right there now is actually, um, because I'm doing design science research, one has all of these cycles of going backwards and forwards between uh, what you find in practice and in reality and what you find in the literature and going backwards and forwards between that. So again, all this writing and scribbling and diagramming and imagining and documenting what I see in my mind and how things are coming together, how I join the dots, all of that really evolves over time. Um, and 
every time I feel, OK, that now is a point where it makes sense, then I would print it. I would document it properly in a PowerPoint. That's actually my the, the nascent theoretical concept for my framework for emerging agility in enterprise data management. So, so that's actually what that top right uh, diagram is. But it's been a whole process to, to get it to that point. And I still don't feel it's quite at a point where I can start writing chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, etc. So uh, yeah, it's, it's still evolving. <laughs> And what stage, so, so Tessa, I mean, just on that point, and I mean, just great to have that authentic insights into the life and mind of a researcher. I think, you know, we all sort of um, sometimes think that our, our mind is a bowl of spaghetti at times, and it's it's good to, as you say, step back and see what that evolution looks like. And that's perfect. I mean, people listening to this now um, will go through those stages. But, but if you do just look clinically at the phases of the PhD, I mean, obviously you went through a proposal at some stage. I think you'd already done that by the time we'd originally chatted and then you went into some development of a topic uh, around which you could then start doing some uh, data gathering and analysis, etc. And what yeah. sort of stage would you say are you at at the moment and that you're sort of really trying to make a breakthrough to, to get to the next phase and, and show some progress at least, I mean, uh, from one phase to the next? So the stage where I'm at now is um, <laughs> wanting to rewrite everything I put in my proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> yes, so I, I think to a certain degree, design science research is such because it is not a very linear process. Um, there is iterations happening. So you need a solid enough. So definitely the proposal have played a very important part, but that's not done and dusted as my, my first couple of chapters. My methodology, my philosophy, those things, pretty, pretty good. Um, not too much change leading there, but it was at a point where I now had to start going to the real world with this idea to see what do I find and then to come back and revisit, well, what does the literature say? And then start um, emerging. And that actually, when I uh, collected uh, my data, I did um, 17 hours of uh, qualitative interviews so far. So that, that is one big milestone that I did achieve in 2020, despite all the other hard things and uh, disruptions that happened in, in my life. But, um, that uh, then speaking to people and well, when I had to formulate my, uh, it's, it was kind of semi-structured, unstructured interviews because I wanted people's n narrative, their, their experiences in enterprise data management uh, in their particular role, whether I was talking to a data architect or a, a, a database administrator or an infrastructure specialist or a data quality person or whoever I was interviewing to actually get their experience and not kind of, uh, it wasn't like a survey or a questionnaire, because mm. I needed to prompt conversation. And I was faced with a tricky dilemma that this conversation could go way off track and not mm. give me rich data to the point of what I'm wanting to look at. So that forced me to really um, bring my, uh, to really go back to my theoretical foundation because I had to say, what am I actually going to ask these people? And I couldn't ask them in, you know, highbrow academic terminology and theoretical stuff, which we, they would look at and say, what on earth is this? Um, because emergence happens from complexity Mm -hmm. um, it was a difficult thing to explain. My, my intro to my uh, participants, I had to really bring down to something concise, understandable. And in that sense, um, the fact that we were in lockdown and not being able to do face-to-face -face interviews really played into my hands in a positive way because I prepared a presentation which I showed on the screen um, while I was introducing it. Uh, so mm. that uh, was maybe a bit less personal, but it was then easy to kind of um, clarify what I was getting at. 
But that also forced me to revisit my theory base and refine, 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 which was a good thing. Mm. Um, and then when I got the data, then it made me think more about, well, what is it exactly that I'm that I'm wanting to? It's been a difficult topic, like herding cats, getting it mm. down and down. I, I must only have one cat in the end. Yeah. I, I was trying to get 16 cats into a bag. So <laughs> at the moment, I'm at the stage where I've refined to, to that diagram on the top right. Just um, 10 cats in the bag for now. But that's, that's now come down basically, no, I would say maybe two and a half. <laughs> and I, I was very quite terrified to go back to my data. I did all the transcriptions already, which, which a lot of people say, pay somebody else to do it. But what I found really important um, to sit and do your own transcriptions is really important because for me, you are then already analyzing the data. And as I was listening to what people were telling me and listening to what I was asking and what their responses were, now the conversation went. I had been thrashing out my theoretical background as well mm. in preparation yeah. for those interviews and I could start seeing the, the dots joining. Mm. Um, I used the um, uh, dictate uh, in Word to do auto transcriptions. Struggles a bit with accents, but it was good enough for a first run. So while it was doing that, I would just sit and listen again to the recording and I found that very useful. Then I would sit afterwards and I would do edit all the corrections and at the same time anonymize. Anonymize take out all references to organization and people um, and then start making notes. Um, so that was a tough process. I think every interview was about six or seven thousand words. So that was a lot of editing mm. and typing, a lot. but oh. worth the effort. So to yeah. me, even though it felt like I was going down a deep deep pit and swimming in a huge okay. sea of words, it was yep. worthwhile doing. No, and well so I'm now at that point, so the other day I thought, okay, now I've crystallized that first uh, run, first, this is site design science research cycle one, done that. Now I kind of like went and peeped at my data, terrified that I was going to look at it and say, I didn't get that stuff. I can't throw that framework as a net over my data. Okay. But the first couple of paragraphs I randomly read, I realized I can actually, and I got very excited. Fantastic. So I think one mustn't give up. You often yes. go through this existential crisis, but just keep on acknowledging what you're thinking, focusing, sharpening, sharpening that focus all the yep. time. Great. You know, yeah, that's been well my done. experience. No, fantastic, <laughs> Tessa. So, I mean, you've got now the 17 hours of, of qualitative, you know, interview uh, yeah. data that you've uh, sort of typed up and started to analyze. And I mean, I guess now moving into 2021, you're going to start assessing your model in terms of the data that you've, yes. just, you've gathered from the field. Yes. And then I guess find an evolution of your model that fits the data or reflects, you know, the more accurate version of the data that you've gathered yeah. from the field. And there'll yes. be you know, future updates to model, etc. And I guess this is yeah. the, the value of research to the world is that you can now develop a model at the end of a PhD that is, and in my PhD, I used a method called grounded theory. Yeah. And this, the, the, the name of it says it all, that you develop a theory which is grounded in the data. Um, yes. so it's not an existential academic model. You may start off with a hypothesis of one that you think would work, but then you use that a data gathering process to test it without impressing your bias too much on the data. And I guess yeah. this is the authenticity or the, the sort of uh, theoretical sensitivity that we have to develop as good researchers. So, I mean, Tessa, good luck with all of that. You mentioned, and I mean, um, you know, obviously I think for all of us, 2020 was tough and, uh, you know, presented lots of challenges to us. And, uh, you know, I'm sure like all of us, you've uh, developed some resilience and uh, still grappling with some of the challenges and so on. And what advice would you have for people going through challenges and trying to keep studies going on? I mean, I really love what you said earlier about channeling your stress 
into mm. your studies and I think I did a lot of that myself. It was something that I could escape into and see progress out of it that I was a lot more of I was in control a lot more of it than I was in control of some of the other things in my life. And you get stressed when you don't have control in your life. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So now you can control your studies. So just, you know, use your energy to c control something that you can control. So what would be your your thinking and your advice for people going through tough times? And I mean, I know you've you've, you've gone through some tough times and you are going through them at the moment. So my encouragement to you and my support and thanks for coming you know on the show today to inspire our listeners but maybe just maybe touch on some of those aspects and advice you know for people studying part-time and dealing with lots of other things in their life yeah so i would say two things um to practice uh tenacity and integration don't get too hung up on consistency you know, we, yes, doing a PhD and writing it all up is a process. And I think that process can serve as a framework in, in the background um, to, to hang useful things on and to, you know, to actually help with integration ultimately. But while in the process, uh, to just be real about what you're experiencing in your life and um, how you can integrate what is really happening with uh, your PhD that you are trying to progress? So, for example, I had I have developed quite a painful shoulder spasm to the extent that I had to go for scans and stuff because there was like a lump developing, which gave me a heart attack because one doesn't know what that is until you go for all the. My doctor was concerned, so I went for all of that. This is a couple of months ago. But it just turned out to be stress. We hold stress in our shoulders. So mm. my point being that for me to now, after a day's work, come and sit down in front of my computer, sort of the usual posture, one tries to sit straight, whatever, it was just really painful. I, mm. I could not, after a day's work, sit down and carry on for another two, three hours. Actually writing in my PhD Word document, adding to it, like they say, write 15 minutes a day or, you know, whatever. As you read, uh, write as you read and all those fantastic, yes, they make sense. But sometimes I would just take, I would say, okay, who is my favorite author who really mm. inspires me? So I, let's say David Snowden with his Kinevan framework. So I take that seminal paper, and I see I've scribbled on it before with a blue pen, right? Then I take a green pen or a red pen and I'll go through it again and I make new notes in context of where I've evolved to, where my thoughts are, where I'm at. But I'm maybe sitting in my bed or a comfortable chair. I'm not forcing myself to follow the, the good advice of sit in front of your computer, right as you read. You, you've got it and you've got to type, you, you know, Yep. So you sound, you sound you sound like you've been listening to my coaching videos because I have and and I, <laughs> <laughs> and and I think I think I mean you know what's great about this conversation, Tessa, is and I mean I put those out in my on my YouTube channel and I mean it would be great if people can go and subscribe there and you know those are often very sort of optimistic and ideal, but the yeah. reality of it is that but even if you only apply ten percent of it or you adapt it. You make yes. it work for yourself. And the examples that you've given us today have, have shown you as how that is possible. And so any sort of coaching tips that you get from myself or from anybody else, you know, must be taken with a pinch of salt. They, they, you know, it's not a magic formula. It's ideas, it's suggestions, it's worked for somebody. It might not work for you. Um, I think we can never get away from the fact that reading, writing and thinking are integral sort of, it's like oxygen for us as research yeah. students. but whether it's at your desk, whether it's, you know, um, listening on the treadmill, going for a run outside or writing in your yeah. notebook on the bus, on the train, on the plane, you know, it's the, the, the richness, I think, is in the variety of the experience. And I love what you said yeah. about not getting hung up about consistency. And this is where I see people actually failing more is because they set themselves up with these unrealistic expectations. And, yeah. you know, often you sort of had a, a short enough horizon I just have to get through today or I just have to yes. get through the next week. I just have to get through the next couple of hours of reading and I'm going to choose something that I want to read because I know I can accomplish that. I can tick it off and I can feel better about myself. So you chose Kinevin, 
you know, yes. Dave Snowden's work is excellent. And I, you know, I love listening and reading and watching his stuff as well. And I'll have my favorite authors that if I'm finding it difficult to get into other topics that I will just default to those. And I think that's great advice for people um, listening today. I, I also found, found Peter that I don't know, I'm, I'm sure a, a lot of other PhD students, the whole point is you've, you're working with something new. So you have to create something new from existing knowledge. But in essence, what you're creating is something new through the PhD. Otherwise, it's not PhD worthy. It's got to be new, unique. It's got to be uh, useful. So I found um, maybe because my study is so multidisciplinary, um, emergence is from complexity. So I had to go into the complexity science thing. Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework gives a very practical framework to, to understand where complexity fits in. Um, then again, the socio-technical aspects because enterprise data management is about people and technology. It's an information systems PhD, so that all makes sense. But there is organizational science, there is social science, there is, um, you know, even though I've had such a technical background and my original degree in maths and computer science, this PhD, I, I sometimes think, you know, if I'd been more on the on the, the people sciences side of things, the social sciences, management sciences, it would have been easier. And then I go, but yeah, then I would just be doing what I've always done, mm. just kind of yep. specializing more where I've gone out of my comfort zone. And um, but that's been incredibly rewarding. I mean, I, I'm originally a software developer and now I'm learning enormous amounts about stuff mm. that I didn't even think about before. So I would say anyone finding themselves not extending their existing solid ex uh, work life experience into a PhD that are saying, right, I'm like jumping onto another track and, and going with that to not, not be afraid to do that. Mm, mm. Yeah, doing a PhD is about learning. It is about, so then read far, far and wide. Um, that's that's important to to actually come to understand what are the important pieces of existing knowledge and yeah. how to integrate that the one advantage is i come with i came with very little preconceived ideas um i wasn't trying to tell the world now everything i had learned in my job mm. should now actually be academically formalized and put into yep. the world I, I came in, I, I guess, as a bit of a novice in, in this field, mm. <laughs> PhD. Don't be scared, just do it. Makes yeah. it interesting and fun. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> no, and Tessa, I think just what you were talking there a bit earlier about jumping you know, across the tracks and bringing other fields into your own or diving into those fields and then coming back into yours, you know, that multidisciplinary research or you know, I think they call it um, intradisciplinary research, I think is where some of the greatest contributions are going to come from, um, certainly through the lens of, you know, academic research. And, uh, you know, I found in my own study, I brought uh, social sciences into software engineering to understand yeah. agile teams, for example. You're bringing organizational design thinking into enterprise data management, for example. And, you know, there are lots of examples and many others on this podcast that I've interviewed who have often talked about that and said, you know, maybe studying in a certain field accounting. I mean, I spoke to somebody who studied at Oxford and, uh, you know, he said, I said to him, what's the biggest advice? He said, accountants should go and study art, for example, or do a module, do a module on art. And he said, Steve Jobs. You know, he, he developed his screen design techniques because he spent a year in India studying Sanskrit design of fonts, you know, and if you've read that book, um, you know, you will understand that. And, you know, yet we think of him as a, as a computer engineer, but actually the value and the greatest contribution was in the user intuitiveness of his technical devices that he created. And so the, those sort of exponential leaps of thinking and ways of doing things, you know, that have come in the last number of years, I do think have come from that multidisciplinary thinking. Yeah. So well done. I mean, as you said, 30 years as a software developer and now bringing in other areas to enrich your studies and make that contribution, I just think is a fantastic and inspiring example to all of us 
despite going through what you've going, gone through and seeing, you know, 2020 in a positive sense of being able to, you know, run your interviews on Zoom or Teams and then be able to present your slides and your models, etc. cetera. Um, you know, you see the positive, the silver lining as much as possible in life. Yeah. No, one has to, you know, that's, that's resilience. Resilience is meeting things where they are as they are. So, you know, not wishing they were different and fighting realities and, you know, burning all your energy on trying to change things you can't change. It's rather, well, well I guess because my study is a complexity study, I have had a profoundly personal experience with my topic in dealing with all of this. What, what just on the side, what was so uh, interesting, um, my my first couple of interviews and people that I bounced my my um, topic off of, I, I really had quite a tough time explaining uh, to people not familiar with with complexity. What 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 do I mean with complexity and emergence? I really had to like spend twenty minutes, and I was like, now for my interviews, that's going to take half the interview just to explain that. Mm. But then COVID came along, a horrific terrible thing to hit all of us. Um, but the advantage for me was suddenly everybody just understood complexity. Because <laughs> That's true. <Yeah. laughs> we were COVID, living, we were living through it. We were yeah. living through complexity. I mean, COVID is a complex adaptive system. Yeah. We cannot approach it in a deterministic way yep. and say, oh, you know, this thing is, we, we just do ABC and it's solved. We had to throw ourselves into that liminal space between complicated and complex. Mm. We all realize, most intelligent people realize it's not clear what COVID yeah. is all about. And then we've spent a huge amount of time swinging down towards chaos mm. in that, that apparatic state of puzzlement. What, what is going on? What? Mm. So, Emergent phenomena em, uh, emerge from that space between complexity mm. and complicated. So I've kind of found I have been able to, through all these other not so positive things that have happened, including COVID, everybody, I could immerse myself even more in my topic. And I guess it's also the mindset I've, I've chosen, you know, channeling okay. to that direction as opposed to throwing my hands up and saying it's too much, I can't do a PhD along with everything else. I was sorry, no, going, well done. can make sense of my PhD topic because <laughs> of all this chaos <laughs> and complexity. <laughs> well done. No, Tessa, fantastic. And I mean, just as we wrap up this you know, very inspiring and authentic um, you know, chat that we've had, which I've learned so much and I think has been so useful for our listeners, maybe just give us some indication you know, what sort of if you, I mean, I know day by day, week by week, but if you do step back and say, you know, sort of where do you want to be by the end of this year, 2021, you know, or have you pegged some sort of date by when you want to kind of get to some point of completion on your on your PhD? Yes, so I really, I was really hoping to uh, submit this year still, 2021, but, uh, you know, the last two months have just been kind of uh, taken out uh, in terms of timeline. And I decided I'm OK with that. Mm. And I'm sure the university will be OK with that. I mean, yeah. this is, I'm in my third year now. So uh, this, this 2021 would be my officially my third year and my PhD. And it's fine. I think they give us five years and then longer than that you have to start explaining yourself to the dean. Mm. So I think I'm I'm still okay and I'm not going to beat myself up because I set that target and now life happened. Yeah. So but what I what I'm my, my plan is to this year still uh, complete the the final version of my framework. So analyzing my data. I rather going to go for quality and then take an extra six months and in, in that mm. last part I still need to evaluate the framework, so I want to do Delphi technique and evaluate it with uh, between five and seven experts because that's part yeah. of design science research to evaluate the artifact. So I'm looking at now, I would say the around the middle of 2022. 
Okay. So well, that's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we have a chat, I want to. On your whiteboard there, you've got a bit of space at the back there. I want to see a goal there that says mid 2022 um, to hand in. And then uh, you will look at that, uh, you know, when you come in and that's going to give you sort of 18 months from the time we're recording um, this interview. Um, so that'll that'll just be a goal. And next time we chat, I'll just ask you how you're going um, on that sort of goal. So Tessa, any last final thoughts for our listeners? I mean, it's just been such a wonderful and you know, inspiring interview. Thank you for your time today. But any last advice for student success? I would say just stick with it. And the, the reason it is so often scary is because you are deliberately and knowingly walking into the unknown because if you weren't, it wouldn't be a PhD. You would just be documenting stuff that's actually already been documenting, do documented. So, you know, accept it. It is unknown. You know, it's, mm. it is complex to, to do a PhD. Accept that and be okay with it. And, you know, give give yourself a break. It's um, it, it's like we we go through phases of. Being yeah. on top of it and then existential crisis and then swinging between the two but find ways to channel that energy and integrate every everything that you think about write it down note it down if it's formal and you know really think this this makes perfect sense it's perfectly formed and formulated then put it in your phd document that you're working on but don't be scared to you know write down the wild and weird things because mm. there's a reason it pops into your head. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, I mean, on that point, Tess, and one of the things I do coach a lot of my students is that's what the appendices are there for. You know, the appendices are something that is, you know, peripheral and maybe, as you say, just going down a rabbit hole that came up in your study and maybe leads to some future work, etc. But might prove interesting to an examiner that's going through your final report. Doesn't have to break the flow of the document, but yeah. could just be referenced and packaged and contained in that overall contribution that you make and somebody who picks it up could possibly find it useful and have some angle from yeah. that that leads into their work or to yours for example so tessa thank you so much and i, I wish you well um Thanks. in all the chaos that we're living in and sounds like you're making the best of it and you know living that practice of resilience and you know integrating your life with your studies so well done and thank you for your time today Thanks very much, Peter. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, <laughs> and good, Tessa. Luck to, good luck to everyone doing a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, exactly. We wish them all luck. Good luck to our listeners today. If you're doing a PhD, hang in there, be resilient and listen to this interview. There's lots of words of wisdom in it. So Tessa, good luck and thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>